Hello, Film Independent members, and welcome to this Film Independent Presents Q&A for the Oscar shortlisted documentary short film Audible, currently streaming on Netflix. It's not what we go through. It's how we go through it. The reality of this life is that we are going to face some adversity. We must examine who we are. I'm Jen Wilson, Senior Programmer with Film Independent. Thank you to the HFPA and Vision Media, who hosts our uh, Film Independent Presents virtual screening room. Please welcome today's guest, director of Audible, Matthew Ogans. Thanks, Jen. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Um, I, I really, really enjoyed this film uh, a lot. It's extremely transfixing. Um, it was incredibly easy to watch. It was an incredibly easy world to get into. Do you want to... Um, talk about how you came to make a film about um, a deaf high school and their football and cheerleading squads. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I like to think of it as a coming of age story and less of a sports documentary in that, you know, sports cheerleading are aspects of a high schooler's life, you know, for some of them. You know, I actually, it took me um, 10, 11, 12 years to actually get made. Um, I grew up 30 minutes away from the school. My family's still there in the DC, Maryland area near Maryland School for the Deaf. And my best friend since I was about seven years old is deaf. And so in some ways, perhaps unconsciously, you know, I pursued this as a way to connect with him and understand him more um, and had lots of, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> This isn't live, right? Let me just get my dog to calm down. Bob, come on. Sorry. No, it's not live. Even uh, so. So it took like 10, 11, 12 years to get made and lots of stops and starts and different partners along the way um, until I came to Netflix and I really understood the project and the characters and the journey and jumped in with me. You, um, I was looking over your film credits, you've made a lot of um, sports related films. Can you just talk about for you what it is that attracts you to sports subject matter? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I'm not a sports fanatic. I'm not the guy that sits glued to my TV all day on Sunday um, yelling at the television. Um, I kind of fell into it and then kind of connected with it in that I find, I like the story behind the sport, right? And often I find, and, and I think it, it applies to Audible that <clears throat> sports is such a perfect metaphor for life. You know, even a game has a story and ups and downs and tension and almost has that hero's journey, right? Especially if you're an underdog, um, but also very metaphorical and symbolic to the ups and downs in, uh, of life. Um, again, especially in this case. Um, and so I don't do just do sports, but I do come back to it time to time because I'll find just an inspiration, a powerful story that I feel like I connect with on a human level and just feel like I have to tell And this probably audible more than any, any other film I've done because I stuck with it the longest and believed in it when perhaps, um, you know, others along the way didn't. When you, so when you make a film like this, um, do you know what your story is going to be ahead of time or do you, and, and which kids you're going to be focusing on, or do you sort of uh, take as much footage as you can and then find what that story is in the editing? Did you know that Amari was so going, going to sort of emerge as your main character right away? Yeah. I mean, I think it depends on the project. Um, as I've evolved as a fi filmmaker, I try to be more, <laughs> organized and, and plan um, and even go so far as to outline. I never know what someone's gonna say or the endings of certain things, especially for a docu-follow that's not historical. Um, you know, 
It's a great question. I'm glad it took about a dozen years to get made because I knew I wanted to follow a senior because I felt that that graduating into college or whatever you're going to do is such a pivotal moment in any teenager's life, but especially for a deaf teenager that's going from a, let's say, a, 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 the safety of Maryland School for the Deaf and a deaf community out more into the hearing world and becoming more of an adult is scary. But what that meant is every single year I had to recast because that senior graduated. And the reason I like, I'm glad it took that long is because I thought Amari's story really um, epitomized some of the conflicts that at least he dealt with, some of the kids at the school and perhaps the deaf community, his relationship with his father, um, you know, being born into a, a hearing family, his father leaving at a young age, um, his relationship with a gay male cheerleader, you know, a jock and a cheerleader, um, and why they have that, that bond, that relationship, which is Teddy, who may not always be physically present in the film, but he's very felt and very much an important character and catalyst, um, and, and is a main character in the film. And so the tragedy of, of, um, of Teddy um, and, and the other elements I mentioned, I thought really made, made this version of the film stronger. So I did know, you know, at so, a certain point, this was the version we were going to make. And that's the version I, I, I brought to Netflix and then developed from there. Yeah, I thought that was a, a particularly remarkable thing about this film is the acceptance that all these kids have for each other, you yeah. know, um, yeah. gay and straight black and white there it was like these kids were all particularly bonded in a mm -hmm. way that it didn't any of their their differences didn't matter um did you how did that surprise you as well yeah i witnessed that as well probably less surprising in that i'd been going back there for over 10 years so you know i i, I felt that very early on in, in in the process of gaining their trust and being invited into their world right um but i did feel that now caveat being i'm not there 24 7 they're still teenagers i'm you know i'm not there when they're texting and you know, behind closed doors, I'm sure there's still the usual teenage stuff and bullying and arguing. But I did feel, as you said, Jen, more than I've seen before, this, I don't know, a utopia or a safety there where you could just be anything. And perhaps that is because they share a bond that we don't have. You know, they all share this one thing, whether they're gay, straight, black, white, however they identify, um, wherever they're from, whatever the socioeconomics are, there's this one thing, hearing, you know, um, that is a sense that, that they share. Did you have a feeling that it also had anything to do with their generation, like this generation of kids, Gen Z, these things are a lot less of an issue for them? Sure. Absolutely. I mean, you know, we see what, you know, teenagers are expressing themselves, they're exploring themselves, you know, I guess, depending on where you are and what family you're in, of course, um, you're able, as Jalen says in the film, you know, just be yourself, right? He certainly has the confidence too, but it requires your community and your family too. There's other elements. Um, but yeah, I do think you're right, this generation. I spent a lot of time developing this. I didn't want to make an observational film from my point of view. I wanted them, I'm sorry. That's okay. Of course, give me a sec. I actually usually have pretty good luck. I don't know what's going on today. <laughs> full moon the other day we're jinxed yeah no we're good um sorry you asked me what was i oh uh, we were talking about um the this generation of kids and how yeah yeah i know where i was so i spent a lot of time i wanted it to be their film and me just being sort of a conduit or liaison 
for them to tell their film. So I wanted the color palette, everything to feel teenagery, right? And I spent a lot of time talking to them. What do you listen to? Um, what do you watch? How do you see the world? How do you dream? What's your color palette? And wanted to sort of create that, you know? And hopefully, I, I hope we captured that visually, sort of like how at least the kids in this film see the world and dream, if that makes sense. Um, so I guess sort of applying what you said about, you know, that, that tolerance and openness, even to the way we filmed it. I loved this project and how you bring together these, el these elements of um, um, not just like right from the beginning when the kids are at the football game that they're losing and you see them sort of started to melt down and the, the coach is trying to hold them together. Uh, it's resilience. That's the word I was thinking yeah. about. The, the resilience and trying to teach children resilience. Um, and I was thinking about that and I was, I, you know, a lot of us have been trying to reteach ourselves resilience during COVID-19, right? Um, and what, what that skill set is about. And also, um, I loved, because you bring up in the beginning of the movie right away that um, Amari has a cochlear implant which is something that's been controversial in the deaf community. And that Teddy's sort of downfall or the, the thing that partly was involved in his suicide was that he tried to shift into a hearing community. Mm -hmm. And all these kids are on the brink of leaving school and um, assimilating. And I just loved all these, how terrifying that must be for them that they watched their best friends try to assimilate and not succeed at that. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's a big, it's a big, I guess I'd even say symbolic thing in their lives. I mean, I have to say, like Teddy's parents say in the film, it's not just one thing, right? There's, there's, there's other elements to what happened with Teddy. Um, and, and I, it's not my place to, uh, say it's one thing, but that certainly exacerbated it. Um, you know, Teddy's mom in the film probably says it best, um, when she says not having access to communication, you know, when you're going to said it earlier, you know, you can be anyone on that campus. I think that applies across the board. There's a safety, right, on that campus. You're certainly not going to get bullied for being deaf. So <clears throat> now you, you leave that, that space. And we know how teenagers can be, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Um, and obviously very painful in the worst way for, for Teddy, but pretty painful for his friends and community to watch. Had a profound effect on them. Um, hopefully you felt that. A sort of a cautionary tale in the film that lets be a little more curious, empathetic, all human beings. I mean, maybe it sounds cliche, but I think it's cliche for a reason. Like, just be kind, try to get to know someone. Maybe they can teach you something. Right. These kids taught me a lot. Um. So Mar says at the beginning that he only listens to his cochlear implants to listen to music. Yeah. And there's a scene later on where he's sitting around a table with his family who's taught, who's speaking and not in sign language. And then he leaves and, and you ask him if uh, something about isolation, if he feels isolated because he's the only deaf person. Do you think the cochlear implant is something that he would begin to use more once he's out of school and he's not completely surrounded by deaf people. Can you know, it's all happening in real time, can he right? Hear speech. It, it's different for everyone, but he's for him. He's not hearing clear speech. I mean, as he even says, even with headphones on, listening to music blasting, he's feeling it, right? He feels music. He gave me his playlists. You know, the music in the film is inspired by these kids, as I said. Um, 
but he's not hearing the lyrics of that song. So he's not going to be able to have full access to communication in terms of hearing what his family is saying, you know? Um, look, like I said, he wasn't born deaf. He got meningitis around two years old, which that's how my best friend lost his hearing at about the same age, which is interesting. His family doesn't know fluent sign language. They're getting there. They get better and better. They're pretty good. You see it, in the, especially his mom. But even if his family was as fluent as he is, the fact that they are hearing and he's deaf is going to have some kind of separation because you're around that kitchen table. They're not all signing with each other. You know, you're at a dinner, you're, you're, you're at a family outing, whatever it may be, you know, you're sitting around the TV, normal family stuff that we may take for granted. They're all still communicating with each other through voice and hearing. So he's going to be left out and feel isolated one way or the other. Right. And, you know, going upstairs, putting on cochlear implants and listening to music in that cocoon, you know, is a way for him to decompress maybe a way for him to avoid. I'm not his therapist, but. Um, I wanted to talk about the filming of this because uh, it's particularly beautiful to look at. Uh, and I'm not somebody that watched sports either. So I know when, when I am, um, able to watch several football game scenes and be immersed that I know it that's shot really particularly well. Do you want to talk about the look? Yeah. Well? well, I mean, that's great what you said. You know, the idea is we're going to get a sports audience. This isn't, that's just a metaphor. That's the hook. It's, it's ideally we're transcending sport and capturing people that couldn't care less. Right. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm binging the second season of Cheer. I didn't think I'd be into cheerleading. The show and the characters made me interested in it, you know? Um, and so earlier I had said, we really, I wanted to make this, we wanted to make this an audio visual immersive experience, especially since there's not a lot of voice in the film. It's mostly subtitles and captions um, with some sporadic, voice from some hearing characters uh, through, through parents, right? Teddy's parents and Amari's parents um, and a moment with a, a hearing coach that they play against towards the end. And so uh, we wanted to create like this visual film language that felt like how like Amari and the kids and Jalen and Lyra see the world and really get in there and make it feel again, like it's not observational but it's, it's, I don't know if I'm articulating right, but it's, it's really their point of view in a way and really in there with them, almost like the character is someone else in the room with them that's deaf. You know, and, the, and the sound as well, you know, really treating sound like a character. Yeah. Whether it's music or sound design, but, you know, our team really collaborated. So it's one soundscape. And again, talking to Amari, he feels those bass sounds, the distortions. So our composer and our sound design team played with that as well, because we want you to feel that. Yeah. In your gut. I think, um, I, I really appreciated your sound design in this because it's sort of, sometimes you were, it seemed like you, if you were focusing on Amari, you were, um, your, the sound was designed for his particular viewpoint. But at other times, like in the beginning of the film, you know, when they're, they're losing that football game and they're in the locker room, they're so upset. There's la like so many loud noises, people slamming yeah. things. Yeah. And it's, it's, it throws you into this, like, this is what hearing people hear of, of deaf people. Like they don't have a concept of the noises that they're making when they're trying to communicate with each other and the slamming and the stuff. So you think I automatically perceived that something else was going on. And then when you understand what's going on, oh, like, oh, okay. They're just trying to communicate with each other. Trying to exp they're expressing themselves. Falling apart as a team. Yeah. Um, but I also thought, 
I felt like this, the sequences where they talk about how they, they play both hearing and deaf football teams and uh, that sequence at the end where they're playing that hearing football team for their homecoming game and and you hear the hearing coach like they're deaf but you're gonna have to forget about that because they're still can beat you um but then when you show because you asked Amari like how do they talk to each other during the game and talk about what they're going to do they're actually better at communicating with each other than the other football team is I was like so no wonder Dif- and different too and, di- and different yeah. You know, it's different. You know, when remember when they're playing a deaf team, they got to hide their size. Yes. Or they have, yeah. like any team, they have secret codes for their plays, right? right? They don't, even a, even an NFL team, they're not describing the play. They have a name for it. So the other team doesn't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. Their communication is different. Um, it's got to be line of sight, right? They have to see the person signing. So, each player really has to be pretty present and mindful and focused or they'll miss what's going on. They got to catch that quarterback has to catch the sign from his coach and then convey it in a huddle to the team and make sure everyone's watching. Um, And so, yeah, it's different. Have you, so have you showed the film? Oh, sorry, let me say one thing, Jenny, you had said sure. I forgot. In terms of sound, it's interesting. You know, I, early on I learned, you know, it's not, they're not, they don't live in a silent world, you know, that they're actually quite loud and we wanted to show that. So those scenes in the locker room, for instance, banging on, turning off the lights and banging on Uh, the lockers and yelling. Um, That's the way they express themselves. And it's not like all of them are 100% deaf. There's levels. So they they do make noise and they do hear things and they certainly feel things. So I would say silent might not even be the right word. There, yeah, those rituals that they have of of turning off the lights, like all the the dances that they have that they all do together and it was so much about bodies and movement yeah and it was language like, it was like a ballet it was it was so incredible to watch just you know contemplating bodies that young that are able to play football and then go out and dance all night but the way that they were shot was so beautiful and entrancing Thank and you. Um, it's a very sensual film I think I was uh, when I was watching, I was like, why are my eyes so in love with this film? Just like drinking it in. And I think it's, it's, it's a visual, visually sensual um, thing to look at. Um, Thank you. So what about your, your trajectory um, of filmmaking wise? How did you end up with um, making the Oscar shortlist and, and then being on Netflix? Um, I actually, Netflix really made this film with me. It was, like I said, a 10 plus year journey and lots of stops and starts. And the timing was right. And perhaps the timing was right because of Amari's story and Jalen's story and Teddy's story and Lyra's story, right? Maybe it was this year is what connected me more um, and and ultimately Netflix. So I, we, we brought this to, uh, to Netflix and they came aboard as a Netflix original before we started filming. So we very much made this with them. It was um, a really supportive, amazing experience, um, not just in filmmaking, but the sensitivity to accessibility, even in post subtitles and captions. And hey, if it's on service, it's this. If it's shown publicly, it's this. And really having a lot of discussions about that. I mean, I was fortunate. Uh, to have a great partner in, in um, one of the Netflix post people. I hope he doesn't find me calling him out, Stephen Johns, because he's a CODA, which is a child of deaf adults. Both of his parents um, are deaf. His, da- his father actually passed during, um, I think, post. And so, yes, he was my post guru from Netflix, but also personally, being someone that's hearing, but the child of deaf adults, he was really instrumental in, in helping me, like on a personal level, along with my executive producer, Niall DeMarco, who's a deaf advocate, 
in, in getting it right, because this film is for a deaf audience as much, maybe even more so than a hearing audience. You know, it's for everyone. Um, the, I was talking um, to other, some other shorts filmmakers the other day about how, uh, you know, I spent many years, I've spent many years watching the Oscars and for, for most of those years, the shorts categories were like when you'd get up and go get a snack, right? On the, on the Oscars. I think mostly because people didn't have access to yeah. see them. You know, you'd watch the ceremony and, it, and when you would see them present that category, you'd watch the, the trailers for each one and go, oh my God, that looks great. But there'd be Where no way to it? see it. Yeah. <laughs> so you, yeah. do you feel excited that people- Yeah, have, look, it's, it's not just short. Yeah, and it, I wouldn't even say it's just shorts, it's documentaries, you know, they're, I've always loved documentaries, that's why I'm doing it, but there's so much more opportunity now um, because of platforms and outlets like Netflix that um, are embracing documentaries. I think people also in a very complicated world, perhaps psychologically, want authenticity and truth. Um, and you know i don't look at it as a short film i look at it as a film you know it's just a different length and i don't look at it as a a stepchild and neither did netflix and, and neither do these other platforms that i speak to which is perhaps this is the appropriate length for this film but it's a film and it's not lesser than you know and um not saying anyone thinks that i'm just saying you know, if you go onto a platform, it's not saying this is the short film category. It's up there with everything else. And yeah, it's amazing. You know, um, yeah, there's more accessibility to it for sure. And look, if you have a little break or you want to take a little break from work, you, you have time to watch a short film during the day. You don't have to wait till nighttime. Right. So very shareable. Do you think that... Um this form, the, the short form, you'll continue doing work in, in this format? Or do you have any plans to continue um, making shorts? Yeah, I, look, I've, um, I, I'm directing my fourth feature doc right now, but I've done shorts and I'll do another one. It's, I direct commercials and branded content. It's, I do doc series. It's whatever is appropriate for that story. Um, is what I do. And to me, it's all storytelling. You know, if it's a 30 second branded content piece, if it's a series, if it's scripted or unscripted, it still needs the tenets of great storytelling, you know, character. Um, what's it about? What are you really trying to say? What do you want people to walk away with and feel? Um, a narrative arc, an emotional arc, tension and conflict, goals, doesn't matter the length. It's, it's a story. Um, so absolutely, I'd do a short tomorrow, do a <laughs> feature the next day, and then do another short. You know, whatever pulls me. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. <clears throat> this film's incredible. I'm sure that I'm going to watch it again. Um, it's been fun to talk with you about it. And Thank you, Jen. Uh, hey, film yeah. independence been a part of my life since I was a uh, production assistant oh, in yeah? New York back in the day. Yeah, nice. you know, it's like it's a sort of a destination, whether it's even even early days of internet, just, just screenings and Q and A's. And, you know, I didn't go to film school. So in, in a way, places like Film Independent were and still are in my film school in a way to connect with other filmmakers, especially in a time like today you know, where we're stuck in our homes. So oh, thank that's you. That's great to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, take care and um, good luck uh, on the Oscars. Thank you so much, Jen. Appreciate it.